Okay, so um, are there any questions from last time? No. Okay, today we uh, will talk about uh, ER equal to EPR and wormholes and what it what it can say about the uh, AMPS paradox. So first, let's start uh, talking about uh, the simplest uh, simplest solution of uh, spherically symmetric. Uh, Solution of um, of general relativity, essentially the Schwarzschild solution. Um, so this is the simplest solution of vacuum Einstein's equations, and this solution has uh, a Penrose diagram uh, which uh, has this form. Um, so it has. Uh, an exterior, so this region is asymptotically R4, so three spatial dimensions and uh, time, flat space. Um, it has a black hole horizon, so a future horizon and a past horizon. Uh, it has some interior. Um, so this is the what I'm going to call the right exterior. Um, it also has a left uh, exterior. Um, So this is a region which has exactly the same form of the, as the region here on the right. So a second asymptotically uh, R3 solution, uh, sorry, R4 solution, with its corresponding uh, horizon. And also there is, a, there is also a, a past interior. So there is the past interior and the future interior. So these are all the regions of the uh, solution, of the complete analytic continuation of the solution. So this is the simplest solution of GR. Um, the solution, <coughs> of course, the solution that Schwarzschild, in the coordinates that Schwarzschild used, it only covered this region of the solution. And then uh, people uh, found coordinate charts that extended the solution into the interior, and then eventually to all uh, four regions. Okay. So. So Kruskal was the one, uh, I guess, uh, providing this diagram. The solution, um, so if you look at the spatial section here, this uh, spatial section has uh, the geometry of uh, R3 far away. So this is R3. And then um, the spheres, uh, as you go along the radial direction, the spheres shrink. And they shrink to a minimum value here. Um, which is the size of the horizon. And then uh, they continue to expand uh, in the other direction into a second uh, R3. Okay. So this uh, peculiar uh, geometry is uh, sometimes called the Einstein-Rosen bridge. So Einstein and Rosen uh, in 1935, noticed that uh, the geometry had this, uh, this lies with this peculiar geometry. Um, they didn't realize that the, the solution was fully non-singular. I mean, they found that this, uh, that they found some coordinate system in which uh, you could clearly see the spatial slice. But in that coordinate system, G00 was singular at this point, And they say, well, they kind of apologize for the singularity. But, uh, and their motivation was mainly uh, trying to imagine this as a model for elementary particles uh, that was geometrically non-singular. So it was in this, the spirit of what Gary uh, Gibbons was talking about yesterday, of trying to understand uh, whether it could be non-singular solutions of general relativity that could model elementary particles uh, in a non-singular way. So that was their motivation. Um, but well, it's uh, the first realization there was something peculiar with this solution. Um, this is a feature for all, uh, well, for um, for black for other black holes also. So if you consider uh, an ADS black hole, for example, the Schwarzschild ADS black hole, it has a similar uh, Penrose diagram where, uh, with two sides again, the right exterior and the left exterior, um, and um, the only thing that changes is that the asymptotic geometry. It's not uh, R4, but it's simply ADS. So it's the same, same picture. Um, 
And so one can wonder what the uh, interpretation of this solution is. So it's a simple solution, solution of GR and has this peculiar form. And so how should we interpret it? And the idea is that uh, this solution, so each black hole has uh, a set of microstates. So if we think uh, from the point of view of each, uh, of each side, we have R4 and we have some black hole sitting there. Um, so this is the black hole as seen from the exterior from each side. And each black hole has a set of microstates. So we think that black holes, as seen from the outside, are described by e to the s, uh, e to the black hole entropy uh, of uh, microstates, number of microstates. Um, and the idea is that uh, this geometric connection is related to the fact that these uh, microstates are in uh, an entangled state, sometimes called the thermophile double which is equal, well, I guess I'm, maybe I should write here. I'm going to continue here. This is equal to um, a sum over all those microstates of e to the minus beta, the energy of the microstate divided by two times uh, the microstate uh, in the right Hilbert space. So this is the microstate for the theory uh, on the right. And this is the microstate for the theory on the left. And well, this is really the CPT conjugate of whatever state we get here. Now, why, uh, why do we think this is uh, the correct description? Well, let's, uh, let's, for more concreteness, talk about this case of ADS. And let's uh, start with the Euclidean black hole. So the Euclidean black hole has a uh, geometry where the boundary is uh, an S1. So this is the Euclidean time direction with a period beta. Okay, so the length of this circle is beta. And this is the radial direction, and this is the horizon at the center where the circle shrinks smoothly to, to zero. Right? So that's the picture of the Euclidean black hole. And if we cut uh, the Euclidean black hole here at uh, this moment, this is a moment of time reflection symmetry. So we can uh, cut it here and then continue it to Lorentzian signature. And if we did that, then we get uh, uh, a geometry which, let's say, we, we have this Euclidean evolution, which we can view it as uh, preparing the state, preparing some state. And then uh, we continue to Lorentzian signature. And what we get in Lorentzian signature is the upper half of uh, the uh, this uh, two-sided geometry. Okay. Now, if we now think in terms of the boundary theory, so we look at the at the boundary theory. So here uh, we see that at time equal to zero, we have two separated boundaries. These boundaries are not uh, connected to each other; they are two separate. Uh, so here I'm only denoting the time direction, but on each point on this surface there is an extra sphere, right? Uh, the sphere never shrinks anywhere in the geometry, so I can, we can uh, just ignore it. Um, but uh, <coughs> there is also here the sphere on the boundary, <coughs> and so we have here a field theory defined on uh, this space, which is time times a sphere, and here we have also time times some other, so time times a sphere, two separate uh, uh, s geometries. Um, and uh, here we have a Euclidean evolution which uh, connects these two. And what this Euclidean evolution does is it prepares a state in the tensor product Hilbert space, which is precisely this state. So it's uh, so when we when we do a little bit of uh, evolution, we have a sum over all uh, all microstates of the theory, and then it, they are weighted by the amount of uh, Euclidean time that uh, has passed between these two states. These two points in time, and the, the amount of Euclidean time that has passed is uh, beta over 2. And for that reason, uh, we get this uh, f particular factor of beta over 2. OK, so that's, um, that's uh, the interpretation of this. Um, this interp yes. yes. Can you briefly review this left metric with going from Euclidean to Lorentzian and the previous example with the circle? 
this one? Yeah. yeah. So um, let's see. Well, we, we, we saw yesterday that the near horizon geometry of a black hole uh, had the form d rho square minus rho square dt square, right, in some coordinates, right? This coordinate was a rescaled version of uh, Euclidean time. And uh, if we now go to Euclidean time, we now have that the geometry is d rho square plus rho square dt square, right? That's in the near horizon region. So we have, we go from uh, this, uh, this near horizon region to, um, to something which now looks like a circle, right, around the origin. Right, so that's uh, what happens near this point. And we've, so if, if you analytically continue in this way, you, uh, it looks as if this whole region uh, continues into this circle. So it's half a, half a plane underneath and half a ring there above. Yeah, yeah, so naively you would say that uh, the exterior continues to this. That's uh, something you might say naively. Um, but uh, you, you could also say e equally well that uh, what you are doing is that uh, you are taking the full Minkowski space uh, and analytically continue Euclidean time, right? Ordinary uh, Minkowski, you know, Lorentzian time. We continue, yeah. So the x, so here there is an x zero coordinate and an x one coordinate. These are just the flat space uh, coordinates, the ordinary Minkowski space coordinates, where the metric is minus the x zero. Yeah, so we, we, start, we start with this space, and now we continue x0 to i x0 Euclidean, <coughs> right? And here we have again the x1 coordinate, and now this one is the Euclidean time coordinate, okay? So we can equivalently uh, continue it this way. And the two are, are the, yeah, of course, uh, it's the same continuation. Um, and so you can view, uh, for example, this side as uh, coming from evolving by uh, pi over, so here by pi over two uh, Euclidean space from this side to that side, right? Uh, this is, uh, so, so when we continue in from this point of view, we just have the whole Euclidean evolution here below and uh, it's preparing the state on this whole slice. So it's preparing the state on the left and the state on the right, right? and in the correct entangled state, which is the Minkowski vacuum in this case. Right? So in order to get to this state, you assume something on the right, and you get something on the left, or, or um, thermal state? Is there something? Well, we, we, we are, um, what are we saying? So we are, what we are saying is that uh, the state we have here at t equal to zero is whatever state we get by evolving in Euclidean time from minus uh, infinity to zero in Euclidean time. And that, for ordinary field theory, produces the Minkowski vacuum, okay? Um, so that's, uh, that's the state uh, that uh, this Euclidean continuation produces. It produces the vacuum, so it produces the, the standard uh, <coughs> state in, in flat space, right? Um, the what we are saying here is that exactly the same, uh, the same story works for the black hole, and it produces, uh, for the case of the black hole, the state you produce on these slice is the so-called Hartle-Hawking state, is the, or the, the standard uh, vacuum state uh, for the black hole in thermal equilibrium. So it's, this, it's producing a particular state which is uh, representing a black hole in thermal equilibrium with the gas outside. So if you look at uh, the outside uh, geometry here, uh, it, uh, this looks like a, like a black hole in thermal equilibrium with the gas of particles outside, with the thermal atmosphere outside. And when you look at the horizon or the near horizon geometry, it uh, looks perfectly smooth and it looks like the geometry locally, like the geometry of flat space in the Minkowski vacuum for the same reason that here we were producing the Minkowski vacuum locally. So here the evolution is not to all, to, you know, it's not flat space everywhere. So when we go back down to, uh, when we go back down here in Euclidean time, we have, uh, of course, a different geometry. The geometry. This picture, you know, the one this picture, yeah. The one, this picture on the left, 
is, uh, yeah, maybe I, I, maybe I should rather write, write the formula so that uh, it becomes more clear, uh, the eraser. So let me write here what, the, what this formula represents. So first, uh, let's uh, write down the formula for the, for the ADS black hole. So this is the formula. So we have uh, the formula for the ADS black hole, right? So, well, I won't remember all the details of the metric, but so we have this uh, minus uh, some mass over R to some power, right? And then, so, uh, R to some power, same power here, uh, d tau dt squared. So this is ordinary Lorentzian time, and then we have some r squared uh, d omega to some dimension, right? So this is dimension of ADS minus two squared, okay? So we have the standard uh, Schwarzschild ADS black hole, right? Yeah, it's, it's plus, so when m is zero, we get the standard ADS space, right? Uh, r equal to zero is perfectly smooth. And then we, for a massive black hole, we get this. And now we uh, simply, so this picture represents the same thing, but with Euclidean time here. So tau Euclidean, right? So here I'm only representing the tau direction and uh, the radial direction, right? So this point here is uh, the horizon radius, so the point where this guy uh, goes to zero size. And here, this is r equal to infinity, right? So here we represent the boundary of ADS at r equal to infinity. So it's a kind of, a, it's a Penrose diagram. So we're conformally rescaled, where uh, as usual we've uh, rescaled this, this distance which is infinitely far away to a finite position. Right? So that's, uh, that's this picture. That's the, lower half or that's, the whole that's the whole thing. So the whole thing. Uh, we have a Euclidean time, which is a circle, right? The radius, uh, well, to so radius beta. Euclidean, right? Yeah, it's this left is, is, is purely Euclidean. Yeah, yeah, so this is purely Euclidean. We have a rotation symmetry, which uh, is simply the translation symmetry here in, uh, that we see in the metric. And it's rotation because this shrinks to zero at the origin, and we impose a periodicity that makes the origin non-singular. And that determines the periodicity beta of the Euclidean time direction, right? So that's, uh, that's uh, this space. And now what we are doing is we are, it's also uh, from this picture, we see it's symmetric around the uh, reflections on this axis. And what that means is that if it is symmetric, it's an even function of uh, some, uh, this uh, coordinate here. And so we can um, go to Lorentzian time and we'll get a real metric. And the real metric we get is this metric of the two-sided uh, black hole. So if, if we just analytically continue tau in this metric, we'll get the coordinate chart that describes only the outside, for the same reason that here we get the coordinate chart that describes only the Rindler wedge. But we could uh, choose here other coordinates, or more, let's say, Kruskal type coordinates. Uh, which are analogous to these coordinates x0, x1 that we get in flat space. And then we continue, uh, well, we could choose Kruskal type coordinates for this uh, Euclidean solution, which would have this sign, and then continue to Lorentzian signature. And uh, then we would get uh, the full eternal black hole in uh, these Kruskal coordinates. Um, okay, so that's... Um, I mean, these Kruskal coordinates are nothing very mysterious. It's just simply, so we simply have, there, there is a set of coordinates where the metric uh, looks like this, divided by some function of uh, minus x0 squared plus x1 squared, right? This is a function of the radial coordinates. And so that's uh, the same type of coordinate chart that we used here to map uh, these two, um, to a finite region. So this diverges when this whole thing goes to one, we have a divergence, which represents the boundary here of ADS. Um, and then the analytic continuation is precisely the same as uh, 
the one we had before. So putting a plus here, that's the Euclidean solution, and a minus here is the Lorentzian solution. Okay. There is a singularity when this is uh, negative, and that uh, corresponds to this region. So here, from the origin, we go to uh, negative values. That's uh, we get the singularity. We go to positive values. We get the boundary. Okay. Yes. 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 Yeah, this is, this is the full Lorentzian continuation, yes, both to the past and the future. Yes. Yeah, so we get this. And this is the full uh, solution, the full Lorentzian solution. Right? So we. Yeah, we get this past horizon. And so we get the black hole, which contains this future horizon. And sometimes people call this uh, region a white hole. Right, so here the singularity is to the past. Somehow here you could get uh, some bad things coming from the singularity. Um, but uh, the state that is produced here is a very special state, right? Um, so when when we yeah when we do this construction, the the we specify the state of the black hole, not at the very far past, but at t equal to zero, roughly speaking. And then we can continue it to either to the past or to the future. So that's, uh, that's what this construction gives you. Um, yeah, I, ne I never said it's a black hole creation. I'm just saying that uh, this, is, uh, this is a construction that uh, constructs the state at t equal to 0. So we, we <coughs> what does this is a construction that gives you what the state is at uh, some time, and then you can evolve it uh, forwards and, and backwards, right? Now, if we talk about uh, black hole creation or things like that, we, we could also talk about this. Uh, and uh, there are, um, okay, well, I I'm wasn't planning to talk about that, but maybe, maybe I should. Um, so you can ask, well, you, 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 one, one thing you could say is, okay, this solution is very nice and so on, but it's completely artificial. We will never, um, I mean, if you have a black hole that forms from collapse, you don't form this two-sided black hole. So if uh, you have a black hole that forms from, from the collapse of a star, what you form is a geometry which uh, roughly uh, has this form. So we have the, the initial star that collapses to a black hole. And so we have the Schwarzschild geometry outside the star and a different geometry inside the star. And the geometry inside the star is such that the radial direction sort of goes smoothly to r equal to zero, and it doesn't continue to the other side. So the sphere, the transverse, uh, let's say, S2, in a spherically symmetric uh, collapse. Um, well, here the sphere is very large, and then when you get to this point, the sphere shrinks smoothly to zero, which is different than what happens in the eternal black hole, where the sphere uh, shrinks uh, to a minimal size and then expands again. Right? So for if you go and uh, have some black hole that exists in I don't know in the sky and so on, and you go to the interior, you don't expect to find uh, the geometry of the eternal black hole. You expect to find this geometry. Right? So um, one is uh, welcome to study this geometry, but here we are trying to study this other geometry simply because it's the simplest solution. So that's a more complicated solution. We'll try to understand this one. It's a it's a weird from some points of view, it's a weird case. Uh, and, uh, but I think studying this weird case will teach us something about uh, how space-time comes, uh, comes about in the quantum theory. It's like uh, in medicine, when you study a pathological examples so some person that has a very weird illness. And, uh, and that's, uh, <laughs> that's this example. It's not the most generic black hole. Even if you have pairs of black holes, it's not the most generic state for this pair. It's a very special state for this pair. But uh, it's, it's a pair that, that it's a, um, the important point here is that uh, uh, the, the, the curious fact about this is that uh, it, despite the fact that we have two completely separate uh, two completely separate um, uh, Hilbert spaces, uh, the fact that we have this entangled state seems to be responsible for the fact that the 
geometry here is uh, connected between the two sides. So we have a connected geometry between the two. Um, the spatial geometry is uh, completely connected between the two sides. Um, but um, despite the fact that there is no causal connection between the two, uh, the two field theories. Um, Well, I mean, if you accepted everything I said before, um, this follows. So what I said follows. Okay. Well, what did we say before? So we said that uh, we said that this uh, was the thermophile double, which uh, let me write it again here, <coughs> e to the minus. So it's uh, this particular entangled state, right? E n, e n bar times e n, right? What is this formula saying? This, uh, this is saying that there are the Hilbert space for the theory on the right, the Hilbert space, the theory on the left. They are completely non-interacting, right? So these two uh, Hilbert spaces are completely, uh, there is no dynamical interaction between this, uh, the Hamiltonians. Is the, the Hamiltonian is the sum of the Hamiltonian of one field theory plus the other field theory. Um, but we have this entangled state, right? That, that we deduced from the form of the Euclidean solution, that we had that particular entangled state. Um, so, um, of, of course, here we are using the ADS-CFT correspondence to, uh, to assert that this uh, state, so it's just to say what, what these states are, because the, exactly what the black hole microstates are, we, we don't have a, uh, just from the bulk description, we don't have a very explicit uh, description of the black hole microstates. So we're using the uh, boundary description only to give a, an explicit description for what the black hole microstates are. So they are the corresponding uh, microstates of the dual field theory. Now in a complete theory of quantum gravity, we would also presumably have a bulk description of the black hole microstates, and we would use that. So, so these are the black hole microstates as seen from the outside. So that we, we think that if we have, uh, and I think this is completely uh, non-controversial. I think it's one of the lessons of, let's say, ADS-CFT and black hole physics, that if we have a black hole as seen from the outside, it, the black hole is described by a certain number of microstates in yeah. a unitary Hilbert space. In this case, I understood, but then yeah. you grossly generalize and you said whenever we have correlation. No, no, well, we, that, that, that I haven't said yet. That, that will I say in a second, but okay. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. What, what, what I said is that in this particular case, no, 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 that in this case, uh, the connection, so why do we have a connection between these two things? Because we have entanglement. So, uh, yeah, so I, I said this, we have, in the, for this particular entangled state, we have a connection, right? So for this particular state, this connection is only due to the entanglement. We, we don't have a dynamic, we don't have a term in the Hamiltonian that links the two sides. There is no term in the Hamiltonian, and the only reason we have a connection is because we have this entanglement. Um, for this particular state. Um, now, um, yeah, maybe I'll, uh, let's say, emphasize some things a little more. So, um, so if we look at some operator here and some other operator here, there will be a correlation between them. Uh, so if it is an operator dual to a massive field in the bulk, the correlation will be given by a geodesic that goes between these two points. And the correlation will be of order one, let's say. Uh, because this length is of order one. Uh, by order one, I mean it's not uh, exponentially small in some time or anything. It's just the length of this. And this, this uh. um, we could also compute this correlation, correlation at later times. And thi this, this now depends a little bit on the dimension. But let's say for two plus one dimensions, you typically get some uh, correlations that come from geodesics that look roughly like this which actually grow in time, and this correlation then decreases in time. For higher dimensional black holes, it's a little more subtle to compute, but they, they again decrease in time as you go forward. Uh, they don't come from an obvious uh, real geodesic like this. But, uh. So notice that if you do the construction of the operators that Joe uh, was talking about yesterday, um, where you construct an operator here by smearing operators here on the boundary. You can do that construction also for the case of a black hole. And so you can construct an operator here and then another operator here. And the correlations between these two will be higher, right? So it will be pretty large because they are closer in space, right? 
But again, everything is, everything is coming from the correlation between these two. There is no dynamical interaction between the two sides. That's, that's what we think, and there is nothing that contradicts this uh, point of view. Um, and so that's uh, one thing we, c we see in this particular geometry. Now, now here in, in this original geometry, these two were two completely separated uh, Minkowski spaces, or in this, in particular, in these slides, there are two separated R three spaces. But uh, one thing we can uh, think about is we can we can imagine that um, that this um, that that this, these two R threes are really part of the same R three but very far away. So imagine now that we have some R three and we consider a spatial slice which is basically uh, similar to this where we have uh, it's not the same, it's just similar, where we have two, uh, two sort of black hole exteriors, right? And so this is R3, uh, far away. Um, but now, uh, we, in some region, we have the geometry, the, uh, the t equal to zero geometry of a black hole. And then we join it, so we join this to this one, which is a similar geometry, but uh, separated by a big distance. So this is a particular R3 geometry, which we can consider. Um, it, uh, it's almost a solution of the, of the constraints of GR. And we can, by modifying a little bit, we can make it a solution of the initial constraints. And then we can evolve it to the future or to the past. Okay? Um, so what this will give us is it will give us a geometry, which from the point of view of each exterior, will look similar to what we had here. So the geometry here near, so if we cut it uh, around here, we'll get the exactly the same geometry here, because uh, near each horizon, the influence of the second black hole is very small. Um, and so we'll get the geometry which is very close to here. I mean, far away is not the same, because this is SO3 symmetric, and this is not SO3 symmetric. Um, but if the two black holes are very far away, we expect that this would be a good approximation to, uh, to the solution. So here, uh, the picture is that uh, we have, in space time, we have two separated black holes. And the distance between these two could be very large. So let's say one could be in our galaxy, and the other one is in the next galaxy, in the Andromeda galaxy. So this is 2 million light years. Um, but they are connected through the interior. So if you are sitting at uh, 1 meter from this black hole horizon at t equal to 0, um, and you are sitting at one meter outside this horizon at t equal to zero, then your distance through the ambi ambient space is two million light years, but your distance through the wormhole, so one is here, one meter here outside, and the other one is one meter on the other black hole, your distance between the, you and the other person is two meters, okay, through the wormhole. Well, well, we'll see what happens when you jump inside, but that's, that's the distance, and if you were to calculate the correlation between, let's say, some quantum field at uh, that time, so let's say you have a scalar field and you calculate the two-point function of the scalar field at point, uh, let's say, point A and B, you will find the, the correlations which are characteristic for, let's say, a massless scalar field in four dimensions, which is two meters uh, squared, right? So the characteristic correlations that we have, we expect from, for a field separated by two meters, two points separated by two meters. Now, are these wormholes, so this is a kind of wormhole, so we can have, in space, certainly we can have this geometric connection. But is this a wormhole that we can use to travel between these two places, right? So is it a wormhole that we can use to to send signals from one side to the other. Um, and what we see is that we, so from this geometry, we see that we cannot use it to send signals. So imagine that we want to send a signal from this point to this point, which at t equal to zero are separated by two meters. Yep. Correlation function, can I interpret it as when I put a 
charge at point A, yes. there would be a potential at point B? Uh, well, I, I don't want to talk about charge so much. Well, uh, this you can you can interpret this as I measured the field value at point A, and I measured the field value at point B, and I compute their product, and then I'll get this. Uh, I, I do this experiment many many times. I prepare these two black holes many many times, and I do this experiment. And uh, if uh, if we do this a sufficient number of times, we'll get this uh, particular uh, correlation. Yeah. Yeah. So the spatial slice is essentially the same as uh, this slice, right? Uh, it has essentially this geometry. So you have outside is this, and outside is uh, this one. Um, now this this solution obeys the the, Hamil the Hamiltonian constraints of GR. So it's a good initial. So you cannot you cannot take an arbitrary slice and declare that that uh, will be uh, the initial value surface. You have to um, you have to obey the constraints of GR, right? This obeys the constraints of GR, right? So in particular, but you can always, you can adjust the solution to this constraint by, so this one here will not necessarily, so this one is exactly, is the superposition of two of this, but in the same space. It will not quite obey the constraints of GR as it is, but you can modify just a little bit the, the time derivative of the metric so that it obeys the... Uh, yeah, one can certainly write down the approximate metric and then correct it. Uh, yes. Um, can I just say, I, I will yeah. discuss not the static version, but the time dependent, you know, the initial data for this in my lecture. Oh, ah, okay. Very good. So, uh, thank you. Okay, okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, uh, very good. So, um, I defer to Gary then. Um, but the, the point is that this, uh, some small modification of this will be good initial surface. And then you, you evolve it. Into, it will be, in the end, a time-dependent solution. This is a time-dependent geometry. There is no global uh, sort of time trans. Well, th this solution has a, a symmetry, an isometry, which, is, um, uh, which acts as a boost around this point. And so it, uh, it has uh, flows. Uh, so if we, if we flow with this uh, symmetry, it has flows which are going forwards in time here, are going backwards in time here, and they are space like in the interior and in the future interior and past interior. Okay? So that's uh, what uh, this, that's the symmetry of this solution, and it's related to the fact that the thermophile double uh, state. Uh, which is this state that we uh, were discussing, which was the sum of this correlated sum of energies with some factors. If we evolve this one future in time, we get the phase factor, which is e to the minus i e n t here. And if we evolve this one backwards in time, we get the factor, which is plus i e n t. And these two cancel, okay? And uh, will they give one, right? And, and so the state is invariant under this, uh, this evolution. Notice that the, this is not an approximate symmetry in the full quantum theory, especially in the ADS-CFT description. It's actually an exact symmetry. Okay? So the boost symmetry around this point is uh, not an approximate symmetry, but actually an exact symmetry of the full theory. Okay. Um, okay. So... Um, right. Now, th this, this, uh, this state, thermal field doubled and so on, this construction of, given, a, given an arbitrary field theory, uh, it's sometimes convenient to construct this state. And the reason is that, um, and, and this has, well, was uh, used, and that's why it has uh, this special name. Uh, it's sometimes useful for constructing it as an auxiliary tool to calculate thermal expectation value. So imagine you want to calculate the thermal expectation value in some theory. So now, now let, let me, I'm making now a di digression, uh, digre a little historical, let's say, or conceptual digression. So imagine you have some thermal field theory that lives on, uh, or, or quantum mechanical system that lives on some Hilbert space H. 
and with uh, some Hamiltonian H and some set of energy eigenstates EN. Then you might be interested in computing uh, thermal correlators, which are expectation values at finite temperature. These are given by trace of uh, e to the minus beta H times um, these correlation functions of operators. Um, and now this is uh, somewhat OK, so you can try to compute this, and you can compute this, no problem, in principle. But it is sometimes convenient, for a reason I'll mention in a second, to view this as an uh, ordinary expectation value in a quantum state. This is not an expectation value in a quantum state. It's a sum of expectation values in many states, right? So this is, a, this is equal to a sum over n of en e to the uh, o, 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 o e to the minus beta en, OK? So that's the standard thermal expectation values, and ex sum of expectation values uh, in all the energy eigenstates. But it's sometimes convenient for reason I'll see in a second, we'll see in a second, uh, to view it as uh, an expectation value in a given quantum state. And you, you can do this at the expense of uh, doubling the system. So you double the system. So now you, instead of considering the Hilbert space H, you consider H tensor, tensor H. Um, and you consider this particular uh, state. And now the operators are always inserted. Let's say you insert the operators only on the left system, here on the left system, on one of the systems. And if you do that, then this thermal expectation value, since you don't have any operators inserted, so here we'll have O. So we have the ENs, the same ENs we had before in the original system. And we have these EN bars. And we have uh, si similarly here a similar sum EM. Um, and EM, we have two sums because we have two separate states. Um, and then uh, this, uh, since there are no operators inserted on the, on the left side, uh, this just uh, gives a delta of N and M. So this identifies these two indices. And we remove this. And we had a factor of e to the minus beta over 2 from each of the sides. So we get a factor of e to the minus beta en. So we get the same as what we had before. So it's trivially the same. And the reason that this representation is a little more useful, or, or it might be useful, is because you can, um, just because in perturbation theory, you can apply the essentially standard Feynman uh, rules to the computation of this. But, uh, but Feynman rules with a funny uh, integration contour, where you have you evolve in Euclidean time for beta over two, then you evolve forwards in time in uh, in one of the sides, then you evolve by beta over two in Euclidean time, and you evolve um, you, you evolve uh, backwards in time in the other direction. And the whole perturbation theory is time ordered along this contour, and so you can apply the usual standard rules, so, uh, but with this funny contour ordering. So that's the only reason why this was uh, useful in the past. It's not, uh, it's not something very deep, I think. It's just a technical uh, so issue. For any what? Yeah, so in, in principle, yes. So the, the, this particular state is simple because it's given by this evolution in Euclidean time. So if you had an uh, arbitrary state, so you can have an arbitrary state, you can evolve forwards and backwards in time. Um, but then the specification of the initial state might be more complicated. And this is what you would do in general if you want to compute expectation values. This is sometimes called the uh, Kaldish formalism in condensed matter or um, Waldeberg or Schwinger in, in formulation. Uh, and there are other names associated to this. Uh, Mahapatra and other people also uh, looked at this from the particle theory point of view. Um, anyway, so that's a side comment. Uh, it's not, this particular point is not very important for what uh, we are doing, but it's uh, the reason why we call this the thermophile double uh, state. Okay, now, uh, we were talking about the possibility of sending signals uh, through this wormhole. And let me, let me here make a bigger picture. Um,
So we had these two uh, points that are t equal to zero are separated by two meters. And we might be tempted to send a signal to this other person. So you send a signal. But the signal can at most travel at uh, the speed of light. And what we see is that the signal doesn't make it to the other side. Okay? So what's happening is that there are these two horizons, which are you can say that what happens is that they touch at this point, but then they start moving away from each other. Here we have a kind of uh, expansion of the universe, right? similar to what we have in cosmology, where the points uh, expand. And they start separating. And here, uh, the, this is a universe which has a, well, it expands along this direction, but it uh, contracts <coughs> along the sphere directions, right? And so here, the universe collapsed before you can make it out of the wormhole. So you can say that what happens is that you try to traverse this wormhole. So what would this person that is trying to go through see? So uh, this person would see that the sphere, so here the sphere, when they cross here, when this person crosses, the sphere has the size of the black hole horizon, right? And as uh, the person continues going in, the sphere starts shrinking. So the sphere is, uh, here has a bigger size. So in this whole region has a bigger size than the size of the horizon. And it's smaller here, and it goes to 0 here. So r is equal to 0 here. And, um, and then it collapses to 0. So the wormhole collapses before the person can go to the other side. <coughs> now, what? Well, um, we don't expect it to be possible, uh, but uh, if uh, bulk causality, so if uh, in the exact description, so tunneling is a small thing, and um, we uh, expect, if the ADS-CFT description of this state is correct, uh, then there we see that there is no causal connection between the two sides, it's just an entangled state. And using entanglement, we cannot uh, send signals to the other side. So from that point of view, we don't expect to send signals. But uh, what do we expect just from the bulk point of view? I mean, the fact that GR had this uh, weird solution was weird solutions with wormholes and so on was noted a uh, long time ago in the 70s. I think Wheeler and Fulling, Fulling were the first to, well, where they discussed these issues. And um, one, uh, one important observation is that um, is the following. So here we've seen that there is this wormhole. And you might wonder that this opens a Pandora box. So for this case, particular case, we cannot send the signal. But there might be other wormholes which uh, allow you to send the signal. So we can put some extra matter or modify this a little, bit mo a little bit and in such a way that we can send the signal. You can ask, is this possible? And it turns out that if the null, the null energy condition is obeyed, So that is, if, uh, if classically, so if t minus minus is bigger than 0, um, then you can uh, show that uh, there is no way to uh, make a wormhole, so, so make a geometry that connects two spatially separated regions uh, that allows you to send signals. Okay? So when you add matter to this, uh, you only make this problem worse somehow. You, you don't... Uh, you, you, you don't you don't have a situation where it allows you to go to the other side. Now, you might say, well, but I know that quantum effects allow uh, t minus minus to be negative. So you can have situations where, at some points in your space time, t minus minus could be less than 0. So could it be that by some quantum effects, you actually can do this? So even though it cannot be done classically, it maybe can be done uh, quantum mechanically. Um, now, wh wh why can this be negative? So let me, let me just uh, digress a little bit. So, um, so when we have in quantum mechanics, so when we have, let's say, let's do light con quantization of the field. And so we express the field in terms of uh, uh, sum over or integral over momenta, the uh, p minus, and we'll have some factors of uh, square root of p minus. And we have a, so we have creation operators, and we also have uh, annihilation operators and creation operators, and we have phases and so on, right? E to the i, p minus. I, I don't remember where the, I never remember where the sign here is plus or minus. But, um, 
Anyway, so we have uh, this type of expression for the field, and then when we put it in the uh, stress tensor, then we'll have terms in the stress tensor that contain two creation operators, A minus, A minus, a creation operator, and an annihilation operator, and terms that have two creation operators, right? And now imagine you have uh, the vacuum state. Okay, so we have the vacuum state and we act with a T minus on the vacuum, calculate the vacuum expectation value. We normally, norm here there are two terms and we switch the order of one of the two, producing higher. Okay, yeah, so here I just wrote the expression for the stress tensor with A. Well, um, so for the vacuum, we can normal order it so that this is uh, zero. But now we can consider a state which is a new state, uh, parameterized by some small parameter epsilon, which is the vacuum plus some state with uh, two creation operators. Right? Okay. And if we uh, have a state like this, then when we calculate the expectation value, of course the when, so epsilon will be small, so we'll calculate this to leading order in epsilon. And there will be terms which uh, contain um, the vacuum, this will, will be zero. And then we can consider the terms that are linear in epsilon. And the terms linear in epsilon, so the contribution will come from precisely this type of uh, terms in the stress tensor. And they, the answer will be proportional to uh, well, we, we'll well, there will be one term that will be proportional to epsilon times some number. And then there will be the complex conjugate term, which will be sort of the complex conjugate of epsilon times the complex conjugate of whatever number you have. So this is going to be proportional to the real part of epsilon times some number. And by changing the sign of epsilon, you can see that you can make this uh, positive or negative, right? So if, if it was positive for some epsilon, you can change just the sign and make it negative. So this shows uh, clearly why we can have a negative value for the stress tensor, at least at one point. Now, if you, uh, but this also shows that if you were to integrate over dx minus of t minus minus, then uh, what happens here? So when you integrate, so here uh, we'll have two, two terms that look like e to the i p minus x minus plus p minus prime x minus. Um, and p minus here is uh, always positive. And therefore, if we integrate over x minus, this term will always, uh, will always be 0. Okay? So by integrating over x minus, we can make these terms in the stress tensor, these two terms, uh, 0. And therefore, also this term would be 0. And, um, and in fact, if we do this integral and we calculate the expectation value, we'll always get something positive in flat space. Right? So the integral is actually always positive. Um, at least uh, in free field theory, it's obvious uh, it's uh, always positive, even though we don't integrate over the rest of the coordinates. I mean, of course, if we also integrate over the rest of the coordinates, the rest of the transverse coordinates, uh, we'll get something positive because that's the total p minus of the state. And uh, that would also, so if we also integrate over the transverse coordinates, that will definitely be positive. But it's not only that, but even each, along each, uh, Light, each light ray, x minus, we get also something positive. Okay, so uh, then, um, yes? I, I find it useful heuristically to think about it as the uncertainty principle. Yes. Delta E, delta T, although it's not uh, the right. uh, right. uh, Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, right. So the idea, I, I guess what uh, Rami is saying is, well, we can... Always, so we have the principle that the energy should be positive, but we can violate this principle as long as the policeman is not looking. And so that's, uh, and indeed we violate it. So here we, we see that we can violate it, and we indeed do um, violate it in simple states like this one. You don't have to consider something very complicated. Um, however, the, if you integrate along a light ray, uh, we get something positive in flat space. And in fact, um, there is something called the average null energy condition, which is the idea that you integrate along some null ray, t minus minus, 
And you can ask whether this is positive. So now, now we have a new conjecture. So we can ask uh, if we demand that, uh, so if we demand this condition now, that we, so in the quantum theory, it's unreasonable to demand that t minus minus should be positive at each point, right? However, it seems uh, from what we've said so far, reasonable to demand that t minus minus should be positive integrated along null rays, okay? Um, and so we can now wonder whether this might be true in general. Um, and, and, and indeed, if this is true, then you can show that there are no traversable wormholes. Okay? However, this, this is actually not true in general. And, and let me give you an example. Uh, so the example is uh, consider a two-dimensional cylinder. Um, so this is just uh, time, and this is uh, some S1. So this is a field theory in two dimensions. And consider the null ray that goes around uh, the cylinder, right? Okay. Now you are probably familiar with the fact that uh, in a two-dimensional CFT, now consider a two-dimensional CFT, it could be just a free fermion or a free scalar. Then uh, the expectation value of T minus minus or sometimes called uh, TCC, or sometimes called L0, is uh, the average value, so the integral over this curve, is actually negative. It's minus C over 24 in the, uh, in flat sp in, in the CFT, right? And so it's negative, and therefore, uh, this uh, hypothetical condition we were trying to set up is actually not true. Okay, so can we have wormholes? Okay, no. Um, if it is violated in like, uh, the oh yeah yeah so yeah this this is uh, yeah so if you have a uniform universe and you want it to bounce like uh, in the egg period periodic egg scenario and so on you also need a violation of the null energy condition so in the context of com cosmology the uh, fact that um, the acceleration of the Hubble constant has only one, if you have flat slices, of course if you have a spher spherical slices you can have a bounce just in ordinary the sitter. But if you have on only flat uh, R3 slices, um, then, um, then you cannot have the Hubble constant somehow shrink and then, I mean the expansion shrink and then expand again, um, unless you violate the null energy condition. The Certainly, um, you have to violate it at some time, and then there is an issue of whether, when you maybe some quantum effect might violate it, but you would like to uh, ask whether, I mean, if, if you integrate, maybe it's uh, fine. Um, so um, right now, I'm um, we're trying to see uh, whether wormholes are allowed or not. And so far, we uh, haven't ruled them out because, uh, well, so all the, so we first uh, considered one possible energy condition is violated. We considered another and it's also violated. But now we'll consider one which is uh, not violated, at least not known to be violated. And this is the so-called acronal average non energy condition. Now, acronal means the following. So imagine you have a null curve, right? And so a kernel means that uh, if you have a point here on the null curve and another point here, that this, these two points are not time-like separated, okay? So that in some sense, the, this null curve is the fastest way to get between these two points, right? Because if these two were time-like separated, it means that there is a faster way to get uh, somehow uh, between this, these points. Um, and so, uh, and this curve violates this, uh, this condition because you can go from here to here by following a time-like trajectory, okay? So, um, this is the, the null energy condition which uh, is believed to be true in, all st in any state. And it's enough to prove the uh, lack of uh, wormholes that can send information, that can, the lack of traversable wormholes is, um, 
is ensured by this ichronal average null energy condition. I mean, it hasn't been uh, proven in general. I mean, it, uh, you can uh, you can find uh, some various situations where you can argue for it. Um, but, uh, well, of course, proving it entail proving it in a general CFT coupled to gravity. There is the issue. In principle, all you need is that it, it should be true for um, for field theories which are in spaces which obey Einstein's equations. So it might be that the field theory put in a space which does not obey Einstein's equations might violate this. But all, all you need is that it should be true for spaces that obey the leading order Einstein's equations. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's also. I think it's also true that if um, <coughs> if uh, this is obeyed, then whenever you have a trap surface, you have a singularity. Yeah. So it's enough to prove the singularity theorem. Well, that's, also, that's the basic point about the theorem. You weaken, yeah. you weaken the conditions in the practical. Right, 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 right. Yeah, it can be proven under these more general uh, conditions. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, um, I I don't I don't have a simple argument. This is a result of m maybe Gary has a simple argument. I think the idea is if you have a well pose, then you have what you can mark the trap surface. There were no rays in would go in. And no rays in would go in by the ray chart theory equation, which is written up as of yesterday. Mm -hmm. I mean, the trap surface Gary is talking about is. Yeah. I mean, the trap surface Gary is talking about is that as soon as you go inside the wormhole, right? This uh, this uh, trap surface. So both uh, both not, uh, future going null rays are shrinking. The sphere is shrinking in both directions. Um, okay. So good. So. Um, so things are different than in the movie Interstellar, right? <laughs> so uh, for this one pause. Keeps on what? Keeps on speaking today. Yeah. So Kip might uh, say, might tell you why maybe there is something new to be said. And now to say the truth, in the movie Interstellar, the um, the information is sent in a subtle way, right? So so through some funny coincidences and so on. So maybe you can go through wormholes and uh, and send. Maybe we are getting this information we haven't realized. Like like in the fact that the person who discovered the black hole solution has black in his name. Schwarzschild. <laughs> <laughs> One of those coincidences. That <laughs> um, okay. So now. So we can have uh, this wormhole, and we emphasized here the fact that. We cannot send information from one side to the other. But one thing we can do is we, so if we have two people that are outside their respective black holes, to, so separated by two million light years, uh, let's, them, let's call them Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> uh, their families wanted to keep them apart. So they send one this galaxy and the other one in the other galaxy. And, um, but they can, they can, if they arrange, if they build this black hole, which would be a very difficult thing to do, but if they manage to do that, then um, they can uh, just uh, jump into their respective black holes and meet in the interior. Okay? Now notice that in order for causality to be uh, preserved, no matter what, uh, so let's say someone stays outside of this black hole, so let's say there is a 
Romeo's family stays outside this black hole. His family has no way to, to know that he has met Juliet inside. Right? Nothing that Juliet tells him can somehow make it eventually out of this black hole. Okay, that's uh, what we expect uh, in order to preserve causality. So that's telling you that however this black hole interior is realized in the Hilbert space, uh, Hilbert spaces of the exterior black holes, or whatever the way this interior is realized, it has to be such that it really preserves this uh, causality. Right? It cannot be that uh, if Juliet sends a message and these guys outside uh, can unscramble it by doing very complicated computation, uh, this should not be able to happen. Right? So no matter what complicated computation the guys here outside do, they cannot unscramble the message that Juliet has sent. Okay? And this is a constraint on the construction of the interior. So you cannot think of this interior as uh, you know, some very complicated version of uh, whatever is outside, because if it was that way, then by doing some complicated calculation outside, you could, in principle, read this message. But you shouldn't be able to read this message. So in the classical geometry, the interior is to the future of the, e of the two exteriors. And it's saying that you cannot send any signal from this region to the outside. Right? And this is a feature that we want to preserve in the full quantum description, whatever that description is, that we cannot send a signal to the outside. For example, Juliet cannot send a signal to, uh, to the Romeo's side. Okay? <coughs> Yeah. Yeah. So, so from from the side of if if you have the collapsing black hole, right? Um, then in this particular case, uh, you might think that the interior is some very complicated version of the exterior, and yeah. So it could be that uh, by doing some complicated observation in the exterior, you can read off what whatever happens in the interior. What I'm saying is uh, restricted to, uh, to this situation. And this is a situation which uh, is describing a particular case of a black hole entangled with a second system. Right? So um, what this is saying is that if we have the interior of a black hole entangled, maximally entangled with a second system, that, that's uh, what we have here, uh, then in that case, uh, the interior cannot be viewed as uh, yeah. So we, we have some subtle construction of the interior. And of course, uh, the, we have the weird feature that these two, very separa these two separated systems are sharing in the interior. Right? So uh, our constructions of the interior have to be such that they have this feature. Okay? Um, OK, so that's a constraint for the whatever we construct from the interiors, that whatever happens in the interior stays in the interior. It's secret. Um, okay. Mm. Now, now, what happens if we have things which are not the thermofield double state, but uh, other states? Okay. So so far we've uh, discussed only this uh, thermofield double state, and in order to understand how generic uh, these features are, we would like to understand what happens to other states. So let's uh, try to start going away from the thermofield double state. So the simplest thing we could do, uh, and now let's, uh, let's discuss the eternal two-sided black hole. So if we think in terms of the Schrodinger uh, picture. So at equal to 0, we had the thermofield double state uh, we've been discussing, uh, En. En, right? With the corresponding factors of e to the minus beta en over 2. Now, a simple thing we can do is just do time evolution uh, in. Uh, so we, we said that if we do time evolution forwards here and backwards here, that's a symmetry. But let's do time evolution forwards on both sides. So we multiply this state by e to the, let's say, 2 minus 2 i en t, OK? So that's uh, in the Schrodinger picture. That's a new state, and we can ask, well, what is uh, the geometric representation of this state? So we can think of the state uh, at equal to zero as uh, describing these lies, or perhaps this whole uh, space-time region. 
um, because there is no special choice of slice in the interior, so we can choose different slices. And the physics on all these slices are related by the bulk Hamiltonian constraint, therefore uh, it's equivalent to, <coughs> to choose any of them. But if we now uh, look at the same state at a later time, well, of course, we have uh, different, uh, different, uh, different slices and different space-time geometry. And the difference is that, uh, that now, so before, we had the two horizons. So at equal to 0, the two horizons were very close to each other. And at later times, the two horizons are further away from each other somehow. Um, now, how, how do we understand this? Um, we can, uh, and we'll probably discuss this in a little more detail later, but the idea is that uh, when you have, let's say this is an x direction along the horizon, so this is a spatial direction along the horizon, so a direction which is orthogonal to this surface, right? So, so the horizon it has some spatial extent, so it f goes uh, in a direction orthogonal to this. And at equal to zero, uh, this is, uh, we have a spatial slice that uh, goes, it's like the blackboard. And so these points which are um, at the same spatial position and on opposite sides of the horizon are highly entangled at uh, t equal to zero because they're spatially very closed. Um, at uh, later time, so if we look at the geometry at this uh, later time, let's say on this slice, um, those uh, two sides are now separated by a longer distance and the correlation between these two points is going to be smaller. Okay? Um, and the correlations being smaller is uh, also uh, related to the entanglement being smaller. Or, or if the entanglement is smaller, then also the correlations will be smaller. And we can understand this in as follows. So in some, let's say, some dual description, uh, there will be, this will be some uh, spatial direction. And as time evolves, this, uh, the microstates, so let's say we evolve, uh, let's say, the right side. So these states will start uh, moving around, right? Imagine this is uh, the one dimension of, uh, of uh, one dimensional field theory. Um, and then at equal to zero, we have these uh, correlations which are local in space in the thermal, in the thermal field double. And then as we time evolve the state, we, um, so, so roughly speaking, the correlations are between this point and this point in the original t equal to zero state. But ad, as we start time evolving, these particles start moving around and they spread the correlations so that now the correlations between the two sides is this point is correlated with a bunch of points which are within this region, so has weak entanglement with these guys and the whole entanglement of this guy with the right side is spread over a bigger region. Okay? We'll, we'll see this uh, perhaps uh, in a little more detail later. Um, well, let me see, maybe I could uh, discuss it right now. Um, okay, so this, this is what we expect from a field theory point. So if there was a dual one plus one dimensional field theory, uh, this is what we expect that uh, the entanglement should do as we evolve in time, right? I is this clear or maybe I should clarify more? No? It's clear. What? Not clear. <laughs> Not clear. <laughs> okay, so. Um, what? New eraser? Right, so let's, let's think about a one, one plus one dimensional uh, CFT. Okay? And we'll think about the thermal state in a one plus one dimensional uh, CFT. So the thermal field double in a one plus one dimensional CFT. We were, we were saying that we create the state by doing time evolution like this uh, in Euclidean time, but we also have the spatial direction of the field theory. So the full manifold we use to prepare the state has the form of uh, somehow a strip in Euclidean time, right? So we have the spatial direction of the field theory and we have this strip, this evolution on the strip. And this evolution, so let me, we can draw the strip. The, this is the strip in Euclidean time of length beta over two. And if we do this, then uh, some operator, uh, which is inserted here, will, will have large correlations with something here. 
but will have smaller correlations with something which is very far away. And in fact, uh, in fact, uh, we can say that the entanglement between the quantum degrees of freedom, so let's say we discretize this field theory in terms of a system of spins, right? So those spins will be, um, the spins here will be entangled with the, uh, 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 we, we make block spins of uh, size beta, and those block spins will be correlated across to the other side, but there will be a small correlation between the spins that are far away from each other. And this can uh, be seen uh, more precisely by actually computing the entanglement entropy in the following way. So we divide the system into two regions. So region A consists of the, let's say, right sides of the two field theories, and region B, so the rest is the two sides, and we can compute the entanglement entropy between A and, um, let's say, between A and the rest. And we find that uh, this entanglement entropy is actually finite, some finite quantity, okay? Except for, of course, the obvious UV divergences, but in the infrared, it's, it's finite. Okay? Um, what this is saying is that the degrees of freedom here have some entanglement with the ones here, but they don't have large entanglement with the ones here. So there is no long-range entanglement, okay? So it char it's characteristic of what we have for so-called gapped states, so a state where it has uh, small correlations at long distances. Um, and this is also true that in general for these correlators, these correlators decrease like uh, e to the minus m times the distance between. So correlators in thermal field theory, spatial, correlate, spatial correlators in thermal field theories uh, decrease like e to the minus uh, md, where m is a ma mass gap. Yeah, so the CFT in the vacuum has uh, no mass gap, and indeed if we had the vacuum, if now we have a single CFT in the vacuum and we were to do the same thing of separate region A is this and we were to calculate this entanglement entropy, we would find it's actually infinite. So it's infinite in the infrared. More precisely, we find that the entanglement entropy is C over 3 or 6, I don't remember now, log of, uh, log of uh, epsilon times uh, epsilon uh, L over epsilon, where L is some long distance cutoff. So if we take it to infinity, we get this uh, infrared infinity. This has nothing to do with the UV infinity that appears at short distances. Um, and indeed, there is uh, no mass gap for this theory. When we talk about the mass gap, we're not talking about the dynamical mass gap of the masses of excitations, but we are talking about the decay of correlations, or the mass gap of a state. So mass gap is a property. So in the condensed matter physicists like to use this uh, this uh, language. So it's a property of the state. It's whether correlations in the state decrease exponentially or not. So whether entanglement is short range or not. So when they talk about a state with a mass gap, it's a state where the entanglement is uh, sh essentially short range, except for perhaps some topological degrees of freedom and so on, but which we don't have here. But, um, so it's a situation where the entanglement uh, entropy in a situation like this is, is finite. Um, now, so that's at t equal to zero. Um, well, I mean, uh, of course, the, this, this entanglement entropy can be computed using uh, CFT techniques and so on. I won't get into the details. And you find that it is finite in the infrared. So as opposed to what you get here, you get some uh, finite uh, quantity. Um, Now, in, in the bulk, so this uh, type of entanglement entropies can also be computed in the bulk using the root Akayanagi prescription. I, probably other, speak, the other speakers talk about this? Mark, Mark. Mark, yeah. Okay, so I want, uh, I, only, I will only use the result. So we have this, uh, so we have this, this Penrose diagram, and we also have a direction which is perpendicular to the blackboard, right? So we have, uh, the boundary has two dimensions. One is time and the other one is space. And space is perpendicular to the blackboard. Right? So let's say that region A, so what is to the right of this, is the direction, the part which is uh, above the blackboard. And the part here to the left is the region which is behind the blackboard. Right? So um, the boundary of the region A uh, sits at these two points at t equal to 0. 
and this uh, root eigenary surface that we use to compute the entanglement entropy has to join these two points uh, through the bulk, right? And it has to be a minimal uh, codimension two surface, which in the three-dimensional bulk that we're in here is just a line. Uh, so it has to be some line that joins these two points. And well, look, it's the simplest uh, line is this one, and this is the right prescription. And with this prescription, uh, we reproduce the field theory answer because for this particular setup, this um, uh, this can be computed using the symmetries. It's completely determined by the symmetries, and we we get the the right answer. Now. We can also uh, compute the entanglement entropy at later times. So we not on at equal to zero, but at some later time. And we can compute it both in the field theory and in gravity. And we compute it in gravity, we find that the, se the surface is actually following a trajectory of this kind. Again, it's determined by the symmetries of the theory. Um, and, uh, and a feature of this surface is that it, it starts getting longer. Okay, it gets uh, longer and longer. And one way to understand why it's getting longer is the following. So here we have, uh, remember with that uh, time, the time direction is spatial in the interior. And so this surface has uh, the following form. So it starts at t at some value of time t. It goes in and it goes into the interior and it reaches the interior at roughly the same value of t that we started from. Not exactly the same, but some value of t in the interior, which is uh, within beta of uh, the time we had here. Um, and then it evolves in along this Euclidean direction for some large time t, and then it goes out uh, on the other side. So that's the form of the surface. This surface is essentially following the nice slices that appear in the description of black holes that Joe discussed yesterday. So some slices which are in the interior of the geometry that where uh, things are weakly curved. Um, and are growing as time progresses. So as time progresses, this, these slices are growing. So this is related to this expansion we were talking about the interior. Um, so that's what we see in the bulk. In the boundary, what do we expect? So if we started with this state uh, in the field theory with, with short range entanglement, so this is a state at t equal to zero. Now, and then we evolve. Of course, this state is not a ground state of the field theory. So when we start evolving, it will change with time. So we, let's say we don't evolve this side, we start evolving this side. Uh, it will change, and then the, the particles here will start moving. So here, there was some particle here correlated to this one. We start, uh, we start um, evolving in time. So let's evolve the top part. And let's say Lorentzian time goes this way. So then in the, in a, even in a, in a free theory, for example, we have this. In a free theory, so these particles, there will be, will be some modes will be left moving and some modes will be right moving, and they will start moving to the left or to the right. Okay, so if this particular, let's say, right moving mode was entangled with this one, as time progresses, this mode will be further away from this point. Right. So the initial entanglement, which was just uh, across the, uh, well, which was with the point neighboring the neighboring point here, now has spread to a point which is now very far away. So if we uh, cut uh, the system into two here, we now had that two points which were not contributing to the entanglement. Now we'll start contributing because this will be entangled with this point which has moved to the right. Okay? And the longer, so and all these points that uh, are within this region will also have moved to the right and will start contribute to the, contributing to the entanglement. And so the entanglement entropy will start growing and in, a, in a way which is linear in time. Um, and so we'll find that uh, the entanglement entropy uh, is actually uh, contains a piece which uh, will involve the central charge and, uh, and the length of time that we have waited here, right? Five minutes, yeah. So, so what's the point here? The point is that um, from the field theory, we have a very clear picture for why the entanglement, why entanglement moves, diffuses. And it's not, uh, it's not just across the, uh, the two sides in a localized way, but it diffuses on the second side. And in the bulk, we see that this diffusion is uh, related. Well, is, uh, we, we get the same, the same result by considering the expansion of the surface. So we think that this is a general lesson that um, 
that this separation between the horizons that we have here is due to uh, the more complicated pattern of correlations that we have uh, as time progresses. So at time equal to zero, we had that the correlations were uh, just across the points on the horizon. But as uh, time progresses, the correlations are between um, a point and a whole set of uh, points which are more diffuse. And uh, that is realized in the geometry by making the geometry longer. Okay? That's uh, what we see in this diagram. And uh, we think that that's a general lesson. And we'll, we'll try to uh, be a little more precise about this uh, later. I, yeah. Yeah, so the, the background is, is not time independent. So the, there is a, so if, if we were to, so the, there is one time symmetry, there is one symmetry, which is to move forwards in time on both, forwards in time here and backwards in time here. So the length of this surface and the length of this surface is actually equal, right? So that's uh, the consequence of the, of the isometry that this background has. But what we are doing now is different, which is to move forwards here. And now, indeed, the length of these two surfaces are going to be different. Um, and and you, you find this. And you also, I mean, both in the field theory and in gravity, you ha have the same, uh, the same result. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, this, well, maybe I should make I mean, this, this computation is, is completely straightforward. I mean, it's, uh, so you, you can uh, think of uh, the CFT in, uh, at finite temperature as uh, the same CFT, but in Rindler space, right? Um, so the full line, the full, let's say, right line is the, the left uh, side, the right side, and the other one is the left side, right? And when we divide it into these two pieces, that corresponds to considering, for example, an interval Let's say the right part here corresponds to this part of the interval. So that's the entropy, the same uh, diagram. So if the, the direction orthogonal to the blackboard is the, um, uh, the radial direction ideas, the, the Rita Kainai surface would be this, right? And then as we evolve, in, evolving in time just means uh, considering these slices, right? Um, and now we have uh, this interval. Again, the Rita Kainai, so ev everything is determined by the symmetries. And the only reason we get some non-trivial time dependence here is because um, when we uh, give it this thermal interpretation, we have to regularize, regularize the theory in a, in, with some um, define these correlators uh, in the, with the appropriate metric, the metric of the, the lines at finite temperature. And that gives us <coughs> the, uh, the correct uh, time dependence. So the, the computations are trivial in this case. Uh, but they, they make this uh, general point. All you need to do is just keep track of these uh, rescaling factors in the... Uh. Yeah, Gary. The interior is like a cosmological model, which is then I stopped. Yes. So does this generalize to that system quite independently of any connection with black holes? Um... Well, let me see. I think this question of the entanglement entropy is not uh, so natural in the in the cosmological context. Exactly what uh, um, the, 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 this this issue of dividing the space into two parts is no not that natural. I think in the cosmological context, but um, yeah, indeed, you have this expansion and uh, that's. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, you, you, you could say the same, I mean, okay. Of course, if you look at the diagram of the sitter space, right? So this is the North Pole and this is the South Pole, uh, North and South Pole. Um, we have uh, these cosmological horizons, right? So here, um, well, this is just the point in the sitter space. Um, and then we have here a sphere that uh, it starts expanding. 
And yeah, it is tempting to think that, uh, well, there is some kind of entanglement between these two sides and it's getting more messed up as uh, time progresses. Um, but uh, the yeah, that's right. We don't, we don't have the singularity. We still have the fact that uh, this interior, if we view from the point of view of the observer at the, at the, let's say, the South Pole, this whole thing looks like the interior of a black hole. And um, we might think that, uh, well, it's, uh, it's not really there. And we have some degrees of freedom within this patch, which is a popular, I mean, some, it's, it's a natural conjecture, but it's not so clear because we don't know that uh, indeed this observer is well-defined enough to have a well-defined set of microstates. So in the case of ADS, we really know what the microstates are, and they're well-defined and so on. But this observer here um, is uh, in a space with um, at finite temperature and so on. The observer itself can disappear in, as a result of quantum fluctuations and so on. So it's not clear that uh, we should assign. I, of course, the, the formulas of uh, the black hole entropy that well, you derive for the Sitter space and so on are um, consistent with the idea that uh, the physics for this observer is described by a set of microstates which uh, is given, whose number is given by the De Sitter entropy, so the, uh, the usual value of the De Sitter entropy. Um, but um, it, it might be that this is an approximation in this particular <laughs> case, but not an exact description. But if it was an exact description, so... The yeah. 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 And then in the direction to which you're expanding it, are you saying you'll get increasing or decreasing correlation? Increasing? Increasing or decreasing correlation. I mean, we cut the system in half and then we got to the end. Right. 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 Then, then I'm saying that if we, uh, if the size increases, the correlations are actually. Uh, so the total correlations for the whole system might remain the same. The total entanglement entropy might remain the same, but it's becoming more and more delocalized. The correlations are getting more complex. I'll, I'll discuss this a little more next time. But the idea is that the length of the surface is related to the complexity of the correlations between the left and right sides. Um, I'll try to make this a little more concrete later. Any other question? Yes. Yes. You, 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 you. Could you repeat the question? I didn't get it. Yeah, so the connection between the two? Yeah. yeah. OK. So let's, uh, view, let's think about the quasi-particle picture. right? So we have a bunch of particles. So we have both left and right movers. Just for the sake of the argument, let's only talk about the left movers. Okay. So. Um, so this guy is going to be moving to the, to the right, and this guy is, let's say, going to move to the left. But since we're only going to evolve the right side, the top side, uh, this one I'm going to keep the same. Now at equal to 0, we have uh, these two guys are entangled, and these two guys are entangled. Let me draw a little line for the guys that are entangled. Right? So and similarly here, we have this picture. Right? Now when we cut the system into two, so we, cut, uh, we put the cut here. Um, the total entanglement entropy is equal to the number of dotted lines that we cut. We cut no dotted line, the entanglement entropy, let's say, is zero. So that's the initial value. Now, um, so that was at equal to zero. Now, at a later time, we just follow. Uh, these guys are going to be moving to the right. right? And the dotted lines move together with this guy. So at this time, let's say, the dotted line looks like this. This dotted line looks like this, and so on. So now, uh, if we look at this cut that we were making, so now we make uh, we are at this time, this later time, and we met, make this cut right between the right side and the left side, and we count the number of dotted lines that we cross. That will be the entanglement entropy, and the number of dotted lines grows grows with time, right? And that's uh, what we written here. Um, and this result just follows from the symmetry, so it's true. For the free so for the free theory, this calculation is correct. And for the interacting theory, we happen to have the same answer because uh, of conformal symmetry in two dimensions. Um, so
So that's uh, the picture in the, in the boundary theory. Um, and the picture in the bulk is well what we were discussing, right? Um, so we have these two uh, different pictures of what's going on. Um, of course, here, if we were to draw the right movers, the right movers are doing the opposite thing, right? So um, now we also have the dotted lines going in the other direction, right? Um, and so the initial entanglement, which was, let's say, between this guy and this guy, now will be between this guy and the guy that is here, and the, this guy and the guy that is there. So it's spread over a bigger region. So we, we think, so that, that this is the data, OK? Now there is interpretation. So the interpretation is that the size, this size, which is becoming longer, is related to the spread of this entanglement. That, um, that um, this, um, and, but this is just an interpretation. It uh, could be the wrong interpretation. You might come up with a better interpretation. Uh, but that's, uh, that's the picture. So, yeah. So the correlations, so because of this, because the entanglement is getting spread, the correlations between a point here and a point here are going to be smaller, right? Because in order for two things to be correlated, so in order, if you have an operator here and an operator there, in order, in order to find the large value for the correlation, you need a large value of the entanglement. There is actually a bound that you can prove between the entanglement and the size of the correlations. So if the entanglement decreases, the correlations have to decrease. And in this case, the correlations decrease because the two points are further apart. So whenever you have points which are far, the correlations go down. Okay. So um, so that's uh, so make taking two points to be far far apart makes the correlations decrease, and that's uh, if you wish the that that seems to be how uh, in the bulk the uh, decreasing size of the correlations is uh, reflected. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>